Hi everyone, if you're an existing subscriber, welcome back. And if you're new to my channel, welcome. And why not hit the subscribe button now? Now for those who don't know, I'm Alicia and I've been interviewing inspirational people and businesses to find out how and why they inspire others. This week, I interviewed ex-professional athlete, videographer and business owner, Ross Welch. Here's how it went. Hello and welcome to the channel. To begin with, if you could just introduce who you are and what you do. Sure thing, yeah. So my name's Ross and I own a couple of companies. Um, one of them is a production company. So we create uh, videos and photography uh, content for businesses. And the other one is an academy where I train up um, people who want to basically run their own production company or want to become successful videographers and photographers. So um, I kind of do that as, a, as another uh, part of the business as well. And how long have you done that for? Um, so I have a feeling like these questions are going to come later on anyway. But so for me, like it, I actually, I so used to be a professional skier. So a bit crazy, a bit out there. Um, not, not so much always been kind of this side of the camera or, or business minded or anything like that. Um, so I actually used to, yeah, so I used to ski a lot and travel around and, and used to compete all over the world. I was very fortunate to do that, but I did freestyle skiing. So um, that's when you go off the jumps. You might have seen the snowboarders do a similar thing in the Olympics and all of that, that stuff. So obviously it's inherently dangerous. Um, and after being in hospital quite a few times, I think we counted it up the other day during a, during a quiz that we did with some friends. Um, and I've been in hospital like just over 13 times for like serious injuries. So yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that means that I was just unlucky or if I wasn't actually very good. So yeah, that, that's... <laughs> kind of makes things a bit different um so anyway i what, after i had two my, my final two serious injuries i ended up just thinking what else could i do and i was always passionate about making edits and things like that and filming friends and stuff but it was very much just a hobby um but you know you know we're not getting paid like football players right you know so you can't retire or anything like that you know there needs to be something else so um i kind of fell into filmmaking a little bit but very quickly when i decided i want to do something i kind of i, I give it all my heart and i, and I put 100 percent effort into it and that's exactly what i did with the business and then within a couple of years it literally went from like starting out to employing people um, to having like really reputable clients traveling over the world filming with them and then we've recently just purchased um, a studio which I'm in at the moment and we've just finished the development of that um, and we just kind of continue kind of expanding and, and as quickly as I've kind of mentioned all that it feels like that's as quickly as it's all happened as well it's just been insanely crazy which is good I mean it's good that the business is growing and how did you get into skiing? Obviously, we live in a place with no snow. It's, it's not something what you hear a lot of people do. So how did you get into it? Um, yeah, you're right. Like, obviously, pretty much no snow. And the snow that we get, obviously, in the UK, for anyone that's ever been skiing, you know, will know it's just it's not the same anyway. So not that we have mountains to ski down, regardless. Um, so I actually used to work at the Hemel Hempstead Dry Slope um, just as like a Saturday boy just going and helping out and things like that um, when I was at school and then when it turned into a snow dome so it's now the snow centre in Hemel Hempstead that's when I started to become I'm gonna say good you know I'm gonna be quite modest about this I just got to become the case of like copying tricks that they were doing because freestyle skiing wasn't really a thing certainly not down in the south um, and then I went away to, uh, well, I went away on a holiday, obviously, with family and, and things like that, normally once a year. But after I started to get noticed by brands, so, for instance, Atomic Skis, who are obviously a major global man ski manufacturer, um, they sponsored me not long after the Snow Centre opening. 
And then from there, again, it just kind of seemed to snowball. So I went and did international competitions, the British Snow Tour and various other competitions like that and had kind of like varied results. Like I was never the best skier by any means, like whatsoever. But I very quickly understood that if businesses are paying you or they're at least when you start out, they're giving you loads of free product, there needs to be some kind of return on that investment. So where I kind of found a little niche was more so just providing them with um, social media coverage and um, teaming up with media partners. So leveraging my other sponsors. So Extreme Sports were a huge sponsor of mine. Obviously they had a TV channel and they've got millions of followers. So I would kind of leverage them against each other. So I didn't need to be focused on competitions and doing competition results to earn a living out of skiing. You know, I was actually able to like kind of understand what the businesses want and I saw a lot of friends who are like far more talented than I ever was um, but like really struggling to make ends meet and I think it's just because they didn't really understand like the business element of it and it's not until now where like I kind of sit here having a chat to you and I kind of really think about like how all of that has shaped the business that I have here and like even down to like, things that like everything's negotiable we can swap our services for other things or you know what it is whatever it is to help grow the business um so yeah so it, it kind of fell into it through just working at the snow center and again it just kind of like picked up pretty pretty quickly along with all the injuries as well <laughs> now i think one of the important things you mentioned there was even though you were a professional skier it's important to kind of have that business mentality otherwise you probably won't wouldn't have got to like where you were you probably wouldn't have been a professional do you agree with that yeah completely yeah yeah ab absolutely I think um you know talent does only take you so far like if you don't have the right work ethic if you don't have the right mindset like it really it depends on you and I teach this to people in the academy as well it's you know I can give you all the tools to be successful. Like that's not a problem. The, the problem always lies with what are you going to do about it personally? Like, are, do you want it enough? And a, a thing I think that everyone can relate to is quite simply going to the gym and getting fit. Like there's so many people that will just be like, oh, you know, kind of moan about the fact, you know, I really want to get fit. I really want to do this. I really want to do that. And they're clearly not happy because they're moaning about it, but yet they won't take the first steps to actually do anything about it. Um, so, you know, I know I've answered that in a very roundabout way. I've kind of like, I, I always go off on tangents. Um, but yeah, I, I do think like having an understanding of how business works um, really helped as an athlete. But I think, you know, um, there needs to be an element of talent, but more importantly, like if you're willing to learn whatever it is that you want to do in life, like if you're willing to learn the basics and foundations and, and grow as a person with that knowledge, um, then I just think there's the chances of not succeeding are far lower for sure. I guess it's an element of talent, fun and business. It's almost made up of like three sort of things as such. How many hours would you say you used to put in training trying to get brands um good question very good question i, I honestly like don't know um a lot i mean a, a lot of hours um so we would to give it kind of some um perspective i n now the business is called perspective okay. it, every time i say that word it's always like oh great <laughs> you know coin the coin the term but you know so, yeah to, to give that some depth i think um we would go away for normally about six, between four and six months of a year. And we would live in the mountains in either Austria, Switzerland, France, wherever it is, America. Um, and we would follow the competitions around there. So for about six months of the year, we would be not in the UK. And then we would come back and then spend over summer either in the UK or on a couple of occasions, we would travel down to New Zealand for like four months or so. Um, and then, then the cycle kind of continues. So you're really just going from winter to winter. So you're always kind of on the snow. Um, obviously, if it's a bad weather day, you wouldn't go up. But you would pretty much, my, my routine when I was skiing would be get up early, 
go skiing, come back, go to the gym, spend the evening looking at sponsorship deals. That's not, that wouldn't happen every single day, but most of the days it would do. Or you, instead of going to the gym, we would like look at sponsorship deals and then the next day we would go to the gym and not do sponsorship deals. So um, yeah, it was, it was kind of pretty intense, but you know, it's, it's an absolute dream. And like, I, I always felt fortunate to like, just literally hop on and off planes like they were buses. And, and I, 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 that always, you know, I did find that really, really cool. And I was really pleased to be able to experience that. It sounds cool. Now, I'm guessing that you probably don't like summer then if you're, if you're a skier. <laughs> the person. Uh, yeah, like, n n no. Um, so so when, when I was skiing, no, like, I, I, I'm just coming around to it now, but I hate the idea of just laying still on a beach, like, with nothing to do. Like, it drives me insane. Um, and my wife as well. Um, and this is really interesting because we've been together for 11 years. So she's actually been with me since school and seen me go through this whole career and then to do what I'm doing now. And I always think that that's super, super cool. But she would always want to go on a summer holiday and it would be me that would be like, oh no, like I can't, you know, we need to go somewhere where I can go wakeboarding or, or kayaking or do something. Um, so yeah, I used to hate it, but actually i think as i've got older i'm gonna be 29 on sunday um so I, I am starting to appreciate um having some time to relax no matter what that is <laughs> so i'm kind of coming around to the idea of just relaxing on the beach so in terms of you know traveling quite a bit i imagine that quite a young age obviously you've got friendships back home like you say you like you've been with your now wife for 11 years with her since school. So how did you cope with all that? How did you cope with, you know, everyone being here and you not being here? Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of like a relationship between obviously me and my wife, you know, it, it was hard at times for sure. Um, but at the same point, she's a, um, a veterinary nurse, a registered veterinary nurse. So um, she was at university when we left school and that was obviously really intense, I think for like four or five years, you know, and, and so she had her own dreams that she was achieving. So we wouldn't see each other that much. And, and that was hard. And, you know, this is when Skype like first come out as well you know you, you kind of forget like what the, how times are so different um but we would try to when uh when they would break for uni or whatever she would come out and come and live with us for like a few weeks to a month or so um so that was kind of really nice um and i think you know that that built a really solid foundation for like you know later life for sure like we both always joke that we go to parties and we kind of just go our separate ways because like we don't need you know we obviously value each other but we don't need to be there uh, like around each other all the time i think that's really cool and um, in terms of friendship you know I, I think um my school friends probably found it hardest and i think over time we've kind of drifted apart and that's, that's just something that naturally happens uh, you know it, it just i think we were probably all kind of quite young at the time as well and, and you know i wasn't really into like going out and partying and things because my focus was like this is what i wanted to make you know my my career my job um so i was very much focused on that um but then with that i found like a whole you know i have friends all over the world i could pretty much go to any country and be able to phone someone up and see if they want a coffee um and, and, I, and i really like that um it does mean that coming out the other side of skiing that I have friends now all over the world, but not many people that are really, really close. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, you know. I obviously I do have close friends, but you know, I, I I'm very much a people person, and I really enjoy like spending time with people. But those friends are scattered all over, and a lot of them are still skiing. Um, it means that you kind of drift away from those kind of people as well. So, so for someone watching this wanting to you know dedicate their life to a sport a hobby wanting to do kind of what you did what is one bit of advice that you would say to them in that situation where they don't really know what to do you know they're not with their friends they're not with their family they're not with less like their girlfriend what would you say um i i honestly think you just have to like follow your heart and like go with your gut and and just you know listen like 
do whatever's going to make you happy and like don't let it revolve around money or anything like that like money is obviously important to live but like happiness is so much more important and I, that's obviously sometimes easier to say you know if people are you know with poorer backgrounds or, or whatever you know like, you, you need an element of of money to obviously survive but you really should try to follow your dreams just make it work and I think I, I know that's quite cliche right and and I kind of hate giving vague answers like that but there's no real set thing it's just I, I think just do what makes you happy because at the end of the day right if you think about this let's say you live to 100 and I talk about this lots actually so let's say you live to 100 between like 16 or let's say maybe a little bit later maybe 17 18 all the way through to what, like 65 at the moment, you're working, that, that's when you work. So let's say you retire and you're fortunate to retire at 65, right? And that doesn't leave you very long to do what it is that you want to do. So, and not all of us are gonna live to 100 either. You know, that's a sad reality. So when you lessen that number, you have very limited time to do what it is that you enjoy. And I think, for most of the audience, which perhaps may be a little bit younger or similar ages, you know, I think what's really important to take out that is like, you know, it's so much easier to do it now and it's going to be a lot harder to do it later on as well. So that's why I'm always for like, do it. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. Like just hit the reset button, you know, go back to working a nine to five standard job, build up the funds and then give it another go, you know, and that, that's kind of the same way as I've looked at business as well. It's just, often just been like just let's let's go let's see where where this goes and see what happens and, and you know I certainly speaking from experience um haven't regretted you know any of that even the bad decisions because they've all built everything you know that we have today so I think that's cool that is cool now obviously you did exactly that of what you just said you came out from being a professional skier went into your own business how did you find taking that jump from being a professional skier to then running your own business, you know, supporting yourself, not relying on sponsorship as, as such? Um, it was like daunting, like really scary, like really like unsure if I'm doing the right thing, but like I couldn't carry on skiing forever and I couldn't carry on spending all this time away. Um, so I think like my goals and plans just shifted and you know and I found it really hard mentally as well because like you know anyone who's um an athlete of any level you know has has some kind of ego right and I think people look at ego as like a really bad thing and, and it's not you know not certainly not if you're aware of it and you're still nice to other people that's the main important thing um but I think like you know being a sponsored athlete has a really nice ring to it you know, like not many people in the world can say that at any level um, and let them know do it for your job, for like, you know, periods of, of time. So that was kind of quite hard to break away from it. And I did juggle the two for a little while. As I was filming, I released a couple of ski films that we got sponsorship for through that. So I kind of did fall in and out of it and like kind of juggled the two. But then it did come to a point where it's like, look, you know, you have to make that decision at one point. And most of the students that I teach are people who are in that same position of, look, I do some filmmaking and I really enjoy it, but I just can't go from working my full-time job to then making this my full-time job. Like, how do I do it? And that's the, that's the most exciting point because it's this, that's the point where you build all the foundations for a successful business. And you can kind of, you can structure like, oh, I'm not gonna work at my full-time job anymore. It means that you can actually, um, your full-time job is actually holding you back from your other business growing. And when it gets to that point, you, it's a weird thing because you genuinely feel like you're being pulled. You felt like you're being held back by your full-time job from what you wanna do. And that's a good feeling because when you feel like your job is holding you back from your, you know, your new business, that's the point where you want to cut the ties and just go because you've obviously got some momentum, kind of like a slingshot, I guess. So you did mention briefly, you know, you had some like kind of mental challenges, let's call them. 
what would you mind me asking what they were and how exactly you overcame them as well yeah sure i think um well i i think the main thing was being around like you know kind of not knowing what if you're making the right decision i, I think it always kind of comes around that point of like you're, you're just being unsure of what the future holds you you know and that's why most people stick to their kind of nine to five even boring jobs that they hate like how many people do you talk to that hate their job and yet they're still doing it you know and it's like it's because it's all they've ever known and sometimes people find real security in that and then like they don't allow themselves to grow uh, like kind of away from that because it's all that they've known um so it's breaking that breaking that mold it is actually like quite a hard thing to do um i think in terms of like mentally i think i kind of touched on it with um i guess you know going away and doing what you want like when when i was a skier you know it was literally just like i could wake up every day and literally do what i wanted if i didn't want to go skiing i didn't have to like there was no one telling me these these things as such like you know within reason but i think my, my kind of decision to change careers was kind of I guess in some ways made for me through injury. And I think like the injuries started to kind of pile on top of each other a bit more. And every time like you're in hospital, you, you're just, you kind of reevaluate your life. And I'm sure like anyone that's been to hospital, even for something small, you end up thinking like, you know, just reevaluating where you are in life. And is this what you want to do? And like, and all the rest of it. And, and I certainly went through that quite a lot. And it got to the point where I had, uh, a major knee surgery on my, uh, what, obviously on my knee. <laughs> um, and it was just like, I'm, I'm just done. Like I'm, I'm literally just over this. Like we're talking like months of rehabilitation to then get back to where I was, which is doing the same thing that put me in that position multiple times before. Um, and it just become a little bit less fun, really. It, it just, it just, the enjoyment went. And when you do start getting paid for something, you find it hard to get out of bed for something not, you're not getting paid for, um, which, is, which is completely the, the wrong attitude. But you think, well, you know, if someone's paying me, let's say, uh, for argument's sake, a thousand pounds for this, why would I do this for free? You know, and, and you, you end up, you, you look at life, well, you look at what you do very, very differently when money's involved. Uh, and that just kind of took a bit of like the enjoyment out of it. But, you know, there's no resentment there. I think at the time, it, you know, I wish that I cherished those moments a little bit more, but then they're, they're the moments that I think about now and they help shape my future with my business. And, and it helps me whenever I feel like I'm in that mindset, I just really need to like break away from it. So I'm a firm believer that like, I love self analysis as well, but I just think if you, if you can really pick up on all the bad points, I like, if I was to relive my life again, I wouldn't do anything differently because everything that I've done, even the bad things have led me to the exact same position where I am today. And if it wasn't for those things, the good and the bad, I wouldn't be here. And I'm, I'm very happy in life at the moment anyway with everything. So um, I, think, I, think, I think that that is a very rewarding place to be. And I, I understand that a lot of people don't feel that. And, and, I guess to those people, like, you know, just think about change, what small changes or, you know, or whatever it is, because um, I, I hate seeing people stuck in things that they just don't want to be stuck in. It, you know, in, in a nutshell, it, it's really just like, you know, I like seeing people do what makes them happy. And so many people purposely, sometimes not knowingly, spend their entire life doing what makes them unhappy. Um, and, and I just, you know, I'd like to provide some inspiration, you know, even if like doing things like this and stuff, even if there's just one person, I'd love to see that in the comments or whatever, like there's just one person that takes one little bit of inspiration, you know, um, that, that sense of like, a, not achievement, but that, um, it's just a nice feeling. It's a nice feeling you get with this. Ad. Definitely as well, because it kind of, it shows that what you're saying, you know, you can share your experiences. So I completely get that in, like you say, hopefully help someone else. So yeah, if someone's watching this, definitely comment and <laughs> say, let you know. Now, in terms of your injury, I just 
you mentioned it about when you had the injury that was kind of like the last last straw let's call it now how did you feel being in hospital all them times not being able to do what you wanted to do knowing that it's going to set you back how did you keep going all them times before i mean you've been in hospital 13 times so all them times before how did you keep going to carry on um i think uh, (laughs) when you're younger it is a bit easier right because you don't really think about life has less of a meaning Mm -hmm. to you when you're younger and Oh, it sounds like such an old person thing to say, but like, you know, how young people feel invincible, but like, it's so, like, it is so true. And we always, I always used to say this within skiing, like, um, you're only like, uh, and there's so many amazing kids that come through who have never been injured. And it's not until they get their first injury that you really know what kind of skier or, or athlete they're going to be. Because some people don't bounce back. You can have like literally the, the, you know, the next Olympic hopeful kid who's never been injured and then has an injury and then all of a sudden they're just, they're gone. They're gone in the head. Like it just doesn't, doesn't work for them anymore. And then you also have other people, obviously, I guess like me in the earlier days where you just get injured and keep going for it and keep going and going. And I always pushed it to the back of my mind. Um, Everyone knows the risks, but no one wants to talk about them. And that was a huge thing. Like in the houses we would live in, we'd never talk about anything. It was like a bad omen. Um, certain things would happen on, on the day. And, I, and you're, you're standing at the top of like a 60 to 80 foot jump, learning a brand new trick that you've never done before. Like you don't know how it feels because you've never done it. Like you don't know what you're doing because someone can only tell you if they've done it before, but if they haven't done it before, then you know, you're, you're on your own and you have to figure it out for yourself and you've got about three seconds in the air to figure that out or not. <laughs> um, and so, so no one would really talk about those things. No one would put anything like that in your mind. Um, it's a very, uh, there's, there's nothing that relates to it, standing at the top of a jump, knowing that everyone is thinking about the worst case, but no one's saying it because you just don't want to bring that in. You just, just like, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, you got this, you got this. And it's all like hyped up. Um, but being in the hospital, you know, again, like it would just bounce back. A lot of my accidents were freak accidents as well. They would just be little silly mistakes that just happened. Um, I've had, I've broken my wrists and my ankles and I've had a, a ski go through my triceps. So uh, I don't know if you can see it, but my tricep like, sticks out like just here um yeah a ski basically went into it and oh, i might see it better there um anyway yeah sorry <laughs> everyone's like clicking off um so i land landed on a ski and it ruptured my tricep i had a ski go through my eyelid as well like luckily it just missed my eye it just went through my eyelid um i've been in hospital with neck injuries and uh then i've ruptured all the ligaments in my knee pretty much twice as well so so i mean they're like not <laughs> They're like not nice injuries. They're uh, like pretty, pretty heavy. But I think like, you know, every time I was in hospital, it was just like parcel. It was just like, okay, you know, it's happened. Cool. How do we get healed? Great. This is what we're going to do. This is the plan of action. Boom. And I've kind of taken that forward to business. It's like problem solution, problem solution. Like just being able to be like, right, I've broke my arm how are we going to get back to normal? Oh, you're going to have it in a cast and you're going to do some rehab. Cool. What's the quickest time I can heal? Like with my knee, the first time it didn't require surgery. Mm -hmm. So it was like, what's the quickest way I can get back to skiing? And I had to literally lay uh, in bed and do these exercises meticulously every single day. And when your doctor gives you stuff to do, and I was in Austria at the time, I was being treated by like um, some special surgeons in Innsbruck and they were giving me all this stuff. And it's like, when they tell you what to do, I can, I was doing it to the T every single day. Whereas most people, when your doctor tells you to do something, you don't do it because everyone's lazy or like they just, they just don't like, they don't see any instant benefits. So they just don't bother. And as a result of that, within like nine weeks, I was gone from being, not being able to walk properly to being able to, just about ski on the snow just like very 
gradually. Like, and that was all just because like, I took what they were saying and just like, like put that in place because I was still so driven, I guess. I guess I was still driven by like my aspirations and skiing, but yeah. The last two injuries were the, my two knee injuries, and they, because they took so much work, it 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 then you know, it, it then just got me thinking a little bit more. My my mind wasn't really in it. I was maybe like twenty five at the time as well. Um, so for like uh, particularly a free ski athlete, like I think that's kind of getting a little bit older. Um, not there's actually loads of people still my age that are still doing amazing things, but. Um, they're much better skiers than I was to begin with anyway. So, um, but yeah, yeah. I, I hope that kind of answers in a roundabout way. There's kind of so much to it, but yeah, been injured a lot. It sounds, uh, <laughs> I mean, if anyone's watching this with a bit of a, what's the word for it? Not a good stomach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can throw up some in- images. That will really sell it off. <laughs> I don't know if I could edit that. I'd be like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when um when this uh, when the ski went through my eyelid um we had a photographer with us and he he got some like amazing shots because obviously i couldn't see it um but it was like it was horrendous it was like oh, yeah <laughs> like you're talking Again, about like, you go through your eye you like amazing shots <laughs> yeah 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 insane but like i think oh gosh like there's been a lot of times in my life where fortunately uh things have gone wrong but they've been on the good side of wrong like it could have gone really bad so um there we go we keep moving (laughs) you're lucky you didn't blind yourself yeah you have obviously lots of motivation to keep going regardless of your injuries you kept going you're now successful with your own business how do you stay focused to the end goal i think it all revolves around um, how clearly you can see what it is that you want and how badly you want it. Like it's referred to as like burning desire. And like, if it's not literally a burning desire that you obsess over, mm-hmm. you know, then it, it does make it harder because you're not really a hundred percent in it. And if you're not a hundred percent in it, then you're only going to get 50% of the results which then kind of fuels your belief system into thinking that, well, I was right in the first place. Um, there's this thing, and I would urge anyone to look into it in detail called the law of attraction. Mm-hmm. And it's such like kind of a simple concept about <laughs> just truly believing in something and visualizing it and, and everything will find a way like Will Smith talks about this as well. And, so many you know super famous entrepreneurs and successful business people millionaires and billionaires all share this same thing of um, you know the universe will find a way you just need to tell it where you're um, because they don't know what they want to do and their mind is filled with just mess but the second you say i am going to do this it becomes a reality and the second you do that it has a very funny way of just creating the path for you. So many things have happened on the back of that. And we're all so scared to speak out. We are all so, so scared to say, um, I want to have a million pound company in four years time. You know, because people don't want to be judged. They don't want people coming to them and saying, Oh, you said this and you didn't achieve it. So you're a liar. And like the people who are saying that, are the people that are doing nothing with their lives. Like they're the people that we call them red lighters because they throw up a red light every single time, you know, something happens. Um, you know, we, you, you don't want those people kind of around in those scenarios because um, you just, yeah, you just need to believe it. You need to believe it. You need to follow your dreams. And, you know, I'm talking from complete experience here as well. Like, I wouldn't be saying it if, you know, if it didn't work for me or I didn't believe it or anything like that, you know, but I've visualized this entire place through mood boards. You know, we have a studio, it's on two tiers. Downstairs, we have a huge photography backdrop. We've got a nice chill out area. We've got loads of things going on. Like, I don't sit here surprised. Like, I don't, I'm not like, you know, I'm grateful. And I'm like, you know, someone sit back and I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, this is great. Like, I, I appreciate it. 
it's not a surprise because I've dreamt of this for, for the last couple of years and it's happened a lot quicker than, than I anticipated. Like the day I get, uh, you know, a nice sports car or supercar, you know, I've already dreamt it. I've already experienced it. I've already felt what it feels like. You know, I visualized myself driving down, I have a relatively nice car at the moment, but driving down the road in my car and just pretending it's a Ferrari or, you know, a Porsche or, or whatever, you know. Um, and those things really help because when you can start to feel it in like in your being and you get a full understanding of how it looks, how it feels, how it smells, all of those things, it becomes very hard to ignore. So yeah, like anyone, I have days where I'm not productive and uh, you know, there's little things I do to, to try and help my day along. So I'll have a cold shower. Um, and I mean like freezing cold showers to like um, instantly wake up my nervous system. When cold water hits you, it helps you breathe different, differently. I do meditation to try and help switch off as well. So I get good night's sleep, all of these things. So, but, I have to do that, you know, you have to put in um, by doing one of these aspects, you kind of need to like completely give it, give it your all. And I'm guessing that probably comes from being an athlete. I mean, I horse rode for quite a while and I did exactly the same, you know, before a competition, I visualised me jumping around and winning. So I'm guessing that's probably the same sort of thing as where you've got your visualisation has helped with now visualizing for your business. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, there's so much to be learned from, from athletes, like I'm fortunate that, that I've obviously experienced it myself, but it's certainly all of my teachings have come from that. And it's not until I've left that industry that I have really, uh, it's really highlighted what I did actually learn as an athlete. Um, and, and that kind of you know different difference in mindset um, and this isn't something that just comes to you as well like so people would be fooled into thinking that like oh you know if you're an athlete you can experience this you can learn this stuff like it, it's not hard like I trust me it's not hard and that's why like you know I always teach people about you know my mindset cause it's it's relevant you know it, it's the reason that I'm, I'm here you know, today and, you know, other people um, are having huge successes off the back of like doing these same things and applying it to their own, um, their own processes as well, you know, taking what I've learned and adapting it to things that, you know, work for them. And I think that's really, really cool. It's, it's really nice to see. Fantastic. Brilliant bit of advice for people watching this as well. Now, finally, I have 10 very quick questions for you. Cool. Ready? Okay. Are you ready? I, feel, I need to sit forward in my chair for this. I feel like, right, okay, it's going to be intense. Okay. <laughs> it's not that okay. bad. Would you have a snowboard? Yeah, I do. I can. <laughs> okay. Barbecue sauce or ketchup? Barbecue sauce. One skill you think you must have as a videographer? Oh, um, ambition. Really? Good one. Worst skiing accident you've ever had? Ah, oh my god, it's torn between so many. Uh, oh, I know these are going to be quick, but they're all so bad in their own way. <laughs> I'm going to say, I think I'm going to have to say my eyelid. Yeah, I think but, that's... But it was a very near miss, so... Yeah, between that and my knee. <laughs> Sweet or salted popcorn? Oh, sweet. One unpopular opinion? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh, God, that's really got me. I'm sure I have loads of them as well. Like, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, okay, so this is a very recent one, and I posted this, and it really split my whole fan base. And it was, I said, if you don't come out of lockdown with increased knowledge, a new skill, um, or, uh, you know, losing weight or anything like that, then you've never lacked, you've never lacked time, you've lacked willpower and determination. And a lot of people were like, oh my God, like, no, 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 that's not true. Um, 
you know, we need time to relax and refresh and stuff. And I think how many of those people are going back to work now feeling refreshed and relaxed? You know, they're never going to get this opportunity again. So I think, you know, take this time and use it wisely, you know, expand your knowledge. If, it, if it's something that relaxes you, then just learn about yourself. Very good. Your scariest moment that you've ever had? Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Most of my injuries haven't been that scary. Uh, I almost broke my neck. Well, I fractured like a little vertebrae thing in my neck. That was pretty scary. But yeah, it'll be between that or like, um, oh, there's so many different types of scary. Like one that pops into my head was, um, uh, I was driving a car for a car shoot. It was a really nice car. Um, and we just, we just took the corner a little bit quick down a mountain road and it got pretty hairy, pretty quick. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, yeah, but everyone was fine. So it's kind of like, well, it just creates excitement. <laughs> it's only scary if something bad happens, I think. I'm probably more scared of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite takeaway food? I think it's a Thai. I really like a Thai. Really? Yeah, like a massa man curry. It's really good. good. Favourite chocolates? Um, <laughs> so it will be this, I think it's, it's, it might be Nomo. It's a vegan chocolate bar. Okay. It's cos animals and stuff, so yeah. Oh, never heard of it. Might have to have a look. And final question is, if you had to pick one or the other, what would you choose? Skiing or videography? Oh my gosh. Um, um, oh, that, that's so, that's horrible, that is. I'm going to say videography because it's the person I am today and I think that's really important. And I still go skiing probably about seven times a year and a lot of those are now paid trips for, spon uh, for, like, for, for film productions and things like that. So I'm still fortunate to be able to ski a lot um, and still film at the same time. So I'd have to pick that one. These are really good questions. Very, very good. Very impressed. <laughs> well, you'll be pleased to know that that's the end of the 10 quick questions. Thank you very yes. much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for today. Appreciate your time. You're more than welcome. No problem at all. And I thank you so much for having me on. It's been, been real, real good fun. And um, I love seeing what you're doing to like utilize the time and stuff, like especially over lockdown. I think, you know, yeah, all credit to you for, for continuing with this and building this as well. I think, I think it's amazing. So yeah, carry on with it. And, and I really hope that it grows massively. Now, I hope you all enjoyed that interview with Ross. I think there's a few points that we can really, really learn from that interview. The first point I'd like to talk about is doing something that makes you happy, not necessarily for the money. Because if you do something what makes you happy, you'll be putting more effort in to get a successful outcome. And as we heard Ross talk about, you work for a lot of your life. So happiness is key. Do what makes you happy and you'll have a happy life, as opposed to doing something that makes you unhappy and being miserable. And that is so important for us all to remember. The next point I'd like to talk about is about having that burning desire to do something that you enjoy. If you have that burning desire, you will put in 100%, 110% maybe. Whereas if you don't, you'll probably only put in 50. You won't be visualizing the outcome. You, you won't be putting in as much planning. So you probably won't get to where you want to be. And that is so important for us all to remember. Now you can follow Ross at the links here. If you have someone that inspires you, comment below. I'm always so interested to find out who others find inspirational. Likewise, if you have an inspirational story to tell, comment below, drop me a message on social media or even drop me an email. On Wednesday at 5pm, I'll be speaking with Britain's Got Talent contestants, Soldiers of Swing. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, comment below, let me know what you think and don't forget to hit subscribe. See you all on Wednesday. See you later.